you guys have been following me for a while, you have seen my HP Microserver Gen 8, Big Store. This is my Proxmox backup server. It features four 10 terabyte SAS drives in a RAID Z pool, so I get 30 terabytes of usable space. This is what I back up all my Proxmox systems to, my test system, my test cluster, my production system, all of my TrueNAS data stores back up to this, and some of my other individual servers, like my VPS is back up to this as well. So this is ultimately where all of my backup data goes. The data is still in its original location. This is the second copy. So today, we're gonna to add a third copy, and this copy is gonna be off-site. If you're familiar with the 321 rule of backups, you wanna have three copies of your data on two different storage mediums, one of which is off-site. So maybe we should call it 322. Three copies, two storage mediums in two locations. That would make sense to me. So today I'm implementing that third copy off-site and second medium. So currently my data is stored all over. I got a bunch of different servers, TrueNAS, Proxmox, whatever. The first copy of data is in ZFS on all of them and it's on whatever their native storage device is. And for almost all of them, that's NVMe. Uh, two of them, it's a SATA SSD, but basically it's the native ZFS pool, probably on NVMe or spinning drives. So that has redundancy already. It probably has a mirror. Maybe it doesn't if it's a test system, but whatever. That's my original copy of data. And the first type of data is a hard drive or NVMe. The second copy of data is the backup server here. So all of these are spinning drives. There's no NVMe in here. We're on a ZFS pool of RAID Z for 10 terabyte SAS drives. That's my second copy, but that's still the same medium because it's still spinning Rust. Well, I guess it could be a different medium if it's NVMe and Rust, but it's pretty much the same medium. So I need another medium. I need a third copy of data and I need offsite. So I bought this. This is gonna do all three of those things for me. And it's not gonna cost me per month like cloud storage would. So what is all this good stuff here? This is a LTO tape cartridge. LTO stands for Linear Tape Open, and it is the format for storing data on magnetic tape. If I pop it out here, we can get a look at it. So we've got a square cartridge here. Inside of it, there's a roll of tape, and when the machine grabs it, it pulls the roll out and unspools it onto its own spool inside of the tape transport mechanism. So I paid $30 each for two LTO5, that's a pretty old generation at this point, tape. The current generation is LTO9 that can store 18 terabytes per tape, which is an ungodly amount of data in this big of a space. It's about the same volumetric density as a hard drive, but when a tape isn't in use, it doesn't use any power, and it can go wherever you want. So people will take these tapes and put them in nice foam cases, you can carry it on a plane, you can put it in a safe deposit vault, you can put it in a fireproof, whatever, whatever you got. You can mail it to a friend's house through the mail. They're pretty vibration resistant, pretty resistant to just about everything, the tape itself. So that's why I wanted to use tape. But tape backups and tape libraries are really, really expensive because they're designed for big, big data. But you know how much I love big data here and I want to act like my home lab is real big data. So tape is for me. So to get around the fact that LTO9 and LTO8 tape libraries are really, really expensive and new, I wanted to find something that was used enterprise. You know how much I love used stuff on eBay. So initially I was looking at LTO6. Checks notes. LTO6 supports 2.5 terabytes per tape, which is a lot. So I could fit the entirety of my working data set on two tapes. If I back up every single system I have, that would take up about five terabytes of data. So that would fit on two LTO6 tapes. Of course, I have more than one copy because I want to do a backup, send it off site, and then have a second copy and then swap the tapes back and forth periodically. So if I mail this somewhere else every month, we'll say, so I have an off site backup, I would probably mail it and then get the old one back, back up to the new tape, et cetera, swap them out. But even then, I don't need that many tapes. So anyway, LTO6 was a bit too pricey for me, but LTO5 at 1.5 terabytes per tape, that was just fine. So all in all, I spent about 250 bucks on the drive, including shipping. So this is a Quantum, I have no idea what it is, it's a tape drive. So in the back we got power and we got SAS. This is an SFF8088 connector, which is the SAS 6 gigabit standard, I don't remember which one that is. It's the same one, my card that I use, the LSI 9211 4i4e. So inside my big store, I have an LSI 9211 4i4e. 
So that has four external lanes of SAS, SFF 8088, and four internal SAS that are connected to my four SAS drives. So I just had to buy a SAS cable to go from the external port of my SAS card into my tape drive and set it up in Proxmox. Then I bought a cleaning cartridge. This cleans the heads. I wasn't sure if they'd ever been cleaned or what, so I figured not a bad investment. And just to get started with myself, I bought two tapes. They were 30 bucks each. So that's not a bad price for one and a half terabytes. Um, LT06 would have been a better deal because those tapes are also 30 bucks, but then the drive was more expensive, so LT05 it is. If I like it and I'm happy with this setup, I'll buy myself and have tapes to store all of my data twice, do a backup, send it off site, swap the tapes, good stuff. So you're probably wondering, why would I spend all this money on a tape drive when I can use like Amazon Glacier or Backblaze B2 or something like that? Let's take a look at pricing here. So here we've got Amazon S3 pricing. It is wildly complicated. We have all these different options here. And this is just for the data itself. If we scroll down even further, we can see we charge per request, which is, um, well, it's a lot. So we're gonna go up and we're gonna use our calculator here to see how much it would cost for us to store our stuff in S3. So my particular data tends to be very write only. I create video files, I create video projects, and I keep them forever. So I'm not turning over data as much as you might be if you had like a business or something. I don't know how long you keep business records, but you might be turning over more data. So in my case, I'm benchmarking with one and a half terabytes of data that is essentially static, or I'm adding 50 gigs a month to that. So it's just gonna keep growing by 50 gigs a month. Um, but we're currently at one and a half terabytes, we're gonna say, for the purposes of this. Also, I'm assuming I'm storing it in the Proxmox backup server chunk format. So Proxmox backup server chunks files into this hierarchy, and that's essentially for deduplication. Uh, each file is roughly four megabytes. And if I take a look over here, there are currently this many chunks on my backup server. So 1.07 million, that's a lot of chunks. That would essentially be the number of objects in the bucket. So we're assuming that the put and get requests are in four megabyte chunks from Proxmox. Even though Proxmox doesn't natively support S3, this is just how I'm estimating it for pricing. So we come over here to the calculator, we're gonna create a new estimate, go to Ohio, everyone loves to hate Ohio. Um, need S3, because it's part of S3. Okay. So we're gonna do S3 Glacier Deep Archive. That is the cheapest. If we go here, so instant retrieval, deep archive. So it could take up to 12 hours to get our data back, but it's the cheapest per month. So deep archive, we have 1.5 terabytes per month. Our average object size is four megs and Data is not in Glacier Deep Archive, so we're gonna to have to write it there. And then for number of requests per month, we're gonna calculate that out. So if we say we're adding 50 gigs, so that's 5120 megs, four megs each, 1280. So that's how many requests we're doing each month to put our 50 gigs in that we're adding a month. So 50, nope, that should be 12800. Six, so we got 608 a month so far. Another thing to know about this is if your data does turn over a lot, Glacier requires you keep objects for at least 90 days. So you have to pay for at least three months per object. So if your data was changing a lot, then you would have objects being created and deleted on your periodic backups. In my case, objects are essentially only being created, so they'll last forever until, because I mean, with the way that the chunk system works in Proxmox backup server, I would be pushing chunks as they're created, I'd never be deleting them. So that wouldn't happen to me, that I would have chunks that are hanging out for extra months getting charged, but yeah. What happens if I want to restore my data? So I have to download everything. So now I have to do a restore request, which is a data retrieval bulk, that's the cheapest. If I do a standard request, so I do one restore, well now I need one per every object, don't I? So I have this many objects I need to restore. So it would be 107.5009, yep and I need to return 1.5 terabytes, it's data retrieval, and I do outbound transfer to the internet and 1500 gigabytes. So I'm spending minus my $6 that I'm spending a month, spending 160 bucks just to retrieve my data. 
in transit charges and in re recovery charges. And that's why Glacier is so simple because when you have to restore, you've made it done. How about Backblaze? So Backblaze is a flat 0.5 cents a month. Let's bring the calculator back. So we have 1.5 terabytes, 7.68 a month. So it's slightly more expensive. We don't have to pay for transit, so that's that's good. Download is 0 0.001 or 0 0.01. So and times 0 0.01. So we're spending 15 bucks on recovery. So Backblaze is a pretty decent option too. We'll think about that one. So now how much did I spend for my LTO tapes and when will they pay off? So well, well, we get to watch the backup process happen in the background. So we're gonna say I spent 300 bucks on my LTO tapes and I wanna keep two copies of everything. So I need two tapes of 30 bucks each, so 60. So my investment is 360 bucks. That's the tape drive, the cables, the cleaning cartridge, and two tapes, which is like the bare minimum for this kind of setup. So we'll keep that in mind. So come over here and our price was, so if we want to see how long it pays off, we subtract 1966. Okay, so 340 divided by 608. So 55 months, four and a half years. Okay, so that's about as much as it would cost me to buy new tapes as the tapes wear out. So what if I had a bigger data set? So currently I'm at one terabyte, but say I went to ProRes and everything was suddenly 30 terabytes. Ignoring the fact that I'm gonna to have to spend like thousands of dollars on new hard drives for my base storage, how much would I be spending here in backups? So get back to Amazon Life. So now we are going to archive 30 terabytes per month. And they're still four meg chunks and we're still adding 50 gigs a month. Actually, let's say we're adding 100 gigs a month. So that would be 25, 600. So now we're spending uh, $393.22 plus $37 a month at Amazon. Not including data retrievals. If we have to retrieve data, then we're going to need, got a lot, 30. So this is how many gigabytes, megabytes. So 7 million, just copy that number, 7.86 million chunks. So restore requests, 7, 78, 64, 320. And volume would be 30. And data transfer to the internet. Yeah, we're spending like $3,000 just to retrieve our data from Glacier because we need to restore our backup. That's not fun. So how many tapes do I need for 30 terabytes? So 30 terabytes over 1.5 each. And I'm keeping two copies, so 40 tapes. And I will say 50 tapes, just to be safe. Cost me 30 bucks each, plus the 300 I spent on the drive, 1800 all in. So we subtract the upfront cost, 393.22, we get that, and divide by our 33.31, 42 months. So basically, even with my old tape drive, it's not that bad of a deal cost-wise compared to even the cheapest backup cloud storage. And if I ever have to restore, the cost to me is nothing. And it's not the hundreds or thousands of dollars I'd be spending on Amazon to get my data back. So I'm pretty satisfied that this is a good investment for me to get the tape drive, especially with the level amount of data I have and my projected growth for the future. And it's also something really fun to play with for me. So, I mean, cost wasn't a factor when I made this, but it might be a factor for you. So now that we understand the logic behind using a tape drive, let's try to set it up. So we'll get this guy set up here. So I'm just gonna sit so nicely on top of my micro server too. We've got a power cable for it connected to the kilowatt meter. So we can see how much energy I'm wasting with this thing. Because even though the drives, even though the tapes don't use any power, the drive does. I got a half meter SAS cable, which is the perfect length. And now we're ready to set up the software. I already ran the cleaning tape through it, so uh, we're ready to go. So when I get into this project, I thought I was undertaking a challenge. And if I had a tape library, that might be true, but I just have a single drive. So I was like, why don't I power it on and see what shows up in LS SCSI? So if I come here and I run LS SCSI, so we can see the SCSI devices. So I got four 
Seagate. These are my 10 terabyte drives. I got the two Kingston SSDs. These are my special devices. And I have the internal SD card as the boot drive. So if I power on the tape drive, it's kind of loud, sorry. So if we LS SCSI again, oh, look at that. Quantum Altrium 5 Dev ST0. Like it just worked. That's amazing. So if we go to tape backup, if we had a changer, we could add a changer here. Proxmox has their own system to manage tape libraries. Apparently it's really easy, but I don't have a tape library, so unless you want to send me one, I, I can't test that. But I can go to bare drives, and if you just have a single drive, it'll email you every time it wants to change the tape. So you are the tape changer. In my case, I'm only doing this like once a month or so, or once every two weeks, whatever. It's not a huge deal. So I'm going to click Add. I'm going to name it Quantum, because it's my Quantum Tape Changer. It has no changer, and I already found it because it's the only drive on the system. Add. I literally didn't have to install any software. It just worked over SCSI. This is incredible. So now I have a drive here. I have two tapes that are currently empty, or they might have, well, they're new, so I need to erase them. So I found that the drives, as they come, show up as having information on them already, which I think is just a serial number, but I don't know what, what number from the back it actually is, so I'm going to put a tape in and erase it. So if I read the back of this tape, it has a number that ends in 311. So it's a long number, it's probably a serial number. So I'm going to call this tape, Tape 311. So we're going to put it in. Hello. Please take. Thank you. We do have to do some of this on the command line because the GUI isn't uh, entirely complete. Proxmox tape format drive quantum fast true. I think that's the syntax. Here we go. So this is basically going to erase the beginning of the tape so that it doesn't have any formatting information on it. Yeah, so I, I previously named this 311 when I did this before, so getting all the data off of it to go through the process again with you guys. Okay, so that's all done. If you have a brand new tape, you might have to do this. If you're reusing your tapes in a cycle, you probably won't have to format it every time. So the tape I have in the drive is 301. Tape on the table is 311. So I can create a media pool. If you have like two sets of tapes and you swap them back and forth, you can create a pool that has all the tapes in the first box, another pool with all the tapes in the second box. So I guess we'll call this box one. And allocation, I don't know, continue. Tension policy. There we go. So we have inventory of box one. So we media pool for box one. Now we go to inventory. Inventory is where we add individual tapes. So we're going to add a tape. It is in the drive quantum. We're going to call it 301. And the media pool is going to be box one. So currently I have two tapes. I'm only planning on backing up my video data and my personal data, which is less than one and a half terabytes. I'm not going to back up my media collection, RIP DVDs, Blu-rays, that kind of stuff. Um, at least not yet. So I can fit all of my digital stuff for the YouTube channel on one tape, and that's what I'm going to start with. As my YouTube channel grows, I'll get more tapes, add more to the media set. So it looks like, do we have... Okay, so it, it added that uh, 301 to the media set. Uh, so I can set status, so it's writable, yes. Set location, so it's on site. You can uh, give it a vault number if you want, if it's in like vault 111 or whatever vault it's in, you can add it there for reference. It just keeps that. So that is 301, and now I'm going to eject that. And we're going to back up to do the same 311. If I was doing this like for realsies, I would probably want a tape library and maybe also a single drive to do stuff like this. It would be useful to have a single drive just to do adding new tapes. I guess you can do it with a library too. It's just having a single drive is useful for this kind of stuff. So we're going to create another media pool. It's going to be called box two and add that. And in inventory, we're going to add a new tape. It's in quantum, labels 311. It's part of box two. So since I have two tapes and all of my data for the YouTube channel fits on one single tape at one and a half terabytes, I'm going to keep my YouTube channel data and all of my personal files 
which are about 200 gigs, uh, 200 gigs of personal files, and about a terabyte of YouTube data. I'm going to back those up to these two tapes, and these two tapes are going to form my two sets. So one tape is set one, box one, the tape is box two. So I can mail one off off-site, and then every month or so I can swap them. That's my off-site backup. If you want to do this more frequently, that's certainly fine. I just don't want to spend that much on postage or sending it to friends. I guess if I go to friends' houses, I could take it with me or something like that. But that's basically my strategy. As my data needs grow, I buy more tapes in pairs. That increases the size of box one and box two. Now I can do a full backup, swap it, etc. So that tape now is named 311. The tape on the table here is 301. There we go. So I'm going to say this tape here is off-site, so it is going to move to a vault. That is tape 301, set location, vault 111. Okay. And you are off-site. You're online, on-site. So now I'm going to create a backup job to send some data to tape. So we're going to add, I don't know what we want to call it, videos, local data store, backup, media pool, send you to box one. I don't know, I'll say to do it on the first day of the year. I'm mostly going to run this manually when it's time to do a backup because I have to come down here and change tapes anyway. And then we get a group filter. So in this case, I want to back up video, which is my YouTube channel video, and also projects, which is my personal data. So with video and projects getting backed up, I should be good. So we're going to add that. We're going to use box one. Actually, box one is in vault 111. So we need to edit the job to put it in box two. And run now. So when it starts a job, it checks the label of the tape currently in the drive. And if it doesn't match the tape it expects, it'll send you an email saying, change the tape. So in this case, 311 was already in there. It's just going to get started and it'll go on. This backup will probably take about two hours, which for over a terabyte of data is not bad. When it's done, it'll eject it. The job will finish. If you have notifications in the job, you'll get an email that it's done. If you don't, then you won't. But uh, you know how notifications work in Proxmox. Same as they do in the rest of the Proxmox system. So yeah, this was insanely easy compared to what I was expecting. I was expecting to sit down here for many hours learning how to use tape commands like MTX, which I know is for media changers, but I was expecting to have to deal with like some sort of complexity and this like just plugged in and worked. Now Proxmox claims that they officially support LTO 5 and newer tape libraries and single drives with Proxmox backup server. They don't support LTO 4 and older. So those really, so those really cheap tape drives on eBay that are like LTO 3, like parallel SCSI libraries, yeah, don't get those. LTO 5 and newer, Proxmox backup server, it's super easy. So this is going now. It's starting at 75 megabytes a second. When it gets going, it'll end up running at about 130 to 150 megabytes per second, which is the rate that LTO 5 can sustain. That is pretty darn fast. So you're going to make want to make sure your machine is able to feed the tape at that speed. So unlike a hard drive, a tape drive can't really idle. If, it, if it's writing a stream of data, and it runs out of data to write, the tape transport has to pause, and then when it gets more data, it has to rewind the tape and start again. And that jerking back and forth with the tape transport is really not good for the tape transport, the heads, or the tape. So you want to really avoid that, which means you need to make sure you're able to continuously feed the drive 150 megabytes per second of data the entire time it's running. So the, the four SCSI drives I have in here, they can do about 200 megabytes per second per drive. So I'm able to saturate the tape drive while also saturating my gigabit ethernet connection if I'm doing a backup at the same time. If you were, for example, trying to back up, so if, if your tape server was connected by a gigabit to another server and you're reading data off the other server, you, that would not be good. Um, you wanna make sure you can do the 150 megabytes per second for LTO5. For other LTO generations, it's even faster. Um, you just gotta be, gotta be aware of that. It's a very important thing with LTO tape. So I'm going to let this go for about two hours, and I'll come back to you guys later. So backup took about two hours, and now it's all done. Tape ejected, I can put it back in the box and send it off-site. 
I measured the power draw while the job was running and it was using about 33 watts, which is only about as much as three hard drives. That's not much at all. And it sounds like about half of that's the fan. So if I turn it off and I'm not using it and I'm only using 33 watts during the backup time, that's not much at all. If I were to build a backup server for my third level backup out of spinning drives, it would have been more expensive and it would use a ton more power. Um, I guess if I'm only turning it on once a month and doing an incremental backup, that might not be too bad. But uh, something to consider power usage for sure. My backup server as it is already uses like 50 or 60 watts continuously, which sounds really good in the context of computers, but half of that's going to those spinning hard drives at least. And um, it's, it's more than I would like it to use. Although I'm leaving it running full time because it actually does quite a lot of backup jobs throughout the day and stuff. So, so yeah, that's where it's going. Another thing I forgot to mention earlier is uh, if you do like cloud backups and you live in the US where you have Comcast as your ISP, um, it might just take forever. So quick math here, how long would it take me to back up my 1.5 terabytes of data to Amazon, even if I wanted to pay for it? So 1.5 terabytes, so gigabytes, megabytes, kilobytes, bytes. That's a lot of bytes, so bytes, kilobytes, megabytes, gigabytes, terabytes, and times, oops, times eight, so eight bits, so that's megabits, and I have Comcast internet, which is 25 megabits per second, so over 25, over, so that's bits per second, so kilobits per second, megabits per second, so it would take this many seconds to back up, which is that many minutes, which is that many hours, which is that many days. So I would be saturated my internet connection for six days straight just to send my data up to the cloud. That's quite a long time. So part of the problem is Comcast, a lot of the problem is Comcast. If maybe if you didn't have Comcast, it wouldn't be a problem for you. But uh, for me, sending data to the cloud at that frequency is actually quite a lot of bandwidth. So currently I only do that for my 200 gig personal data. I don't do that for my video files. And so with this offsite solution, I can offset my video files and my personal data without paying for cloud service like I currently do for just my personal files. So hope you like this video. Um, like and subscribe, all that fun stuff. Uh, I have a Discord server linked down below if you want to chat with me about it. If you want to send any tips or anything, I have a Kofi link down below as well. Um, I don't post regularly, so it's not a subscription or anything. It's just a one-time donation, but that's welcome too. Um, and yeah, as always, I'll see you guys on the next adventure.